Acts chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. I'll begin reading at verse 1 from the King James Version. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's go to verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Thank you, ushers, for your reverence to God's word. Father, I ask now, Father, I need now that you would, as promised by your spirit, lead and guide us into all truth. I decrease that you might increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about the spirit life. The spirit life. The spirit life or the life we now live in God's spirit or by God's spirit. The spirit life. Amen. What's, uh, I find it interesting that if you think about how we get to where we are today, um, as Christians, we are, um, we are in the position God wanted us to be in since the fall of man. And what I mean by that is when God begins to start to execute or do his plan uh, of salvation. It's always with the goal of making sure that we uh, are most like him, are most like him. And in a minute, we'll talk about how that happens. But God wants us to be like him. God wants us to be like him. He appears to us in the form of Christ bodily to show us how to be that. And so our goal is to be like Christ or to be Christ-like. You all understand that? But it's interesting how we get here because if you think about it, uh, for those of you who have studied your word, you'll know that in the book of Exodus, chapter 40, uh, the 40th chapter of Exodus, and I won't read it here, but you can make a note for your own study time. The book of Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 35, when we see God, God's presence, uh, his spirit, let me be as clear as possible. When we see God's spirit dwelling amongst men, it starts off dwelling in a tabernacle. Uh, the Israelites having now, they are fleeing Egypt, find themselves in the wilderness and as a comfort, we'll come back to that word, as a comfort, um, God allows his presence to be there 
in the tabernacle. So they're going through the wilderness and there's this very special tent. We refer to it as a tabernacle, this very special tent where literally the presence of God is in that tent. So as long as they're traveling, they have that tent and they're given ways to handle the tent and who enters it and how and all that good stuff. But really when we look at the tabernacle, it's about the presence of God being with his people. So God's spirit is in a tent <laughs> and it's mobile. So wherever his people go, his spirit can go. And how does the spirit travel? It travels uh, with them and is made present in the tabernacle. And there's the Ark of the Covenant and stuff like that. And then at some point, the people settle down in the place and there's a transition. So we go from Exodus 40, the spirit being in a tent, and then we have the spirit in a temple, right? Solomon builds this great temple, this great cathedral, this monument to the power and the beauty and the majesty of the one true God. So it goes from being in the traveling tent to being in this majestic temple, 1 Kings chapter 8. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 8. So now we've gone from having the spirit of God being in the tent, now it's in the temple. And then you come to the book of Acts chapter 2, and we make that next great and really final transition of where the presence of God is in terms of humanity. We've gone from the tent or the tabernacle to the temple to where God ultimately always wanted to be. Not to inhabit a tent, not to inhabit a temple. God always wanted to be in us. He wanted to inhabit a life. So the Spirit of God now lives in a life. That's the fundamental way that we need to understand the Spirit of God. His Spirit is supposed to be in a life. And so the scripture says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons, the children of God. So going through the wilderness, the Israelites were very distinct from all other communities and cultures because they had this God in this tent. And then they became distinct from all other communities and cultures because, because they had this God in this temple. And now we're distinct because we have this God in us. We have this God in us. God is in us. I want you to understand, God doesn't come upon us. God is in us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, God is in us. And even when you don't feel him, or hear him, or in any way sense him, if you believe by faith that you've received the Holy Spirit into your life and that God's presence occupies your life, then 24 hours a day, seven days a week, God is in you. Not a tent, not a temple, but in you. So great, so real is he in you that the scripture actually refers to you as the temple. You are the temple. God always wanted to be in you. And just like he did with Adam, he always wanted to be that companion, that alongside, what we refer to as a paraclete. He always wanted to be that partner in life to you that he could walk with in the cool of the garden, if you will, and just talk to you. God just wants to talk to you. And in a world that is increasingly uh, intellectually sophisticated and all about empirical evidence, it's becoming more difficult for us to accept the fact that God talks to us, but God talks to you. I'm not saying that you're gonna hear a voice as we experience voices. Maybe you will, I don't know. My sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. However you are discerning the presence of God, there is a real line of communication between you and God. Do you believe that? There's a real line of communication between you and God and God is speaking to you every day about everything that's, everything that's important about your life, God is speaking to you. Every step in your day, God is speaking to you. 
Sometimes it's a word of instruction. Sometimes it's a word of correction. Sometimes it's a word of exhortation or exalt, exaltation. Sometimes it's a word of comfort. Sometimes it's just counsel. It's in his wisdom. When you get that thought, you know, you, you ever got a thought and you thought, wow, that's, that's wise. That's not you. That's the God in you speaking to you, giving you guidance and direction. So when you ask yourself, how do I know that God's speaking to me? When your thought life is rich with that kind of wisdom and direction and guidance and even correction, then you know God's spirit in you is active because God brings to you all of these good things. You think the devil wants you to have that? No. And the prophet of the Old Testament tells us that the heart of men are wicked. We do have an internal voice that belongs, that voice belongs to us, but it's a corrupted voice. And it often moves us away from God, not closer to God. God's voice moves us closer to God. And so I just wanted to just start off today by saying to you that when you by faith have received the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, same thing, into your life, he is a real presence. He is a real presence because God wants to be real to us. And he's done everything that can be done to make himself real to us. He's God, the majestic grand creator of heaven. But then he humbled himself, subjected himself to the body of human form and showed us, demonstrated as any loving parent would. He demonstrated. Before your children learned to tie shoes, they watched you tie shoes. Before your children learned to feed themselves, they watched you feed yourself and watched how you fed them. And even when you were training them to feed themselves, you took their hand and guided the spoon to their mouth. God, in the same way, uses his form in Christ to show us how to reach him. He shows us. He guides us. And then there's God in the form of the spirit, which is the power of God made mobile. Because we are tabernacles. We move and we go, but never think you leave God at the church, as some do. Never think you leave God in your Bible, as some do. God is always with you if God is always in you. Y'all believe that today? Yeah. So as I talk to you today about the spirit life, I want you to understand the very basic mechanics of the Holy Spirit. Because without the spirit of God, Without the Spirit of God, you are just a shell, a form without substance. You must be born again, and that which is born of the flesh will always remain flesh. Only that which is born of the Spirit can truly be spirit, which is why we must be born again of God's Holy Spirit. Are you all with me today? Amen. So I want you to look at Acts chapter 2 real quickly with me, and then we're going to go into communion service. And I'm going to show you how the Spirit falls, how it feels, and how it functions. How the Spirit falls, how it feels... And how it functions. In verses 1 through 3 of Acts chapter 2, which we've read, we see that on that great day, they were all together. The scripture says with one accord in one place. They were all of the same kind of expectation. They were all of the same kind of expectation in this one physical place. So not only were they in a particular physical place, but they were in a particular frame of mind which is important to understand what it means to receive the Spirit of God. They were in a particular physical place, but they were also of a particular frame of mind. They had been told to go and tarry for the Lord. Go wait for him. So their expectation was that in some form, some way, he was coming to them. So if I start there, I would say that for you to be filled with the Spirit, because I make no assumptions, although everyone here is pretty familiar to me. I make no assumptions. So let me just start there. In order for you to be filled with God's spirit, there has to be this expectation that you will. You have to expect that God's going to pour himself into you. You start with that expectation because that's what faith gives you. Faith gives you expectation. I'm just getting excited because that's a whole other sermon by itself. Faith plants an expectation in this context that God will perform the promise. Whatever he's promised, he will perform it. I'll talk to you about John, the gospel according to John, chapter 14, verse, I believe, 16, where he says, I will not leave you comfortless. 
That's what he says in that verse. I will not leave you comfortless. He says, I will come to you. That then, if you believe it by faith, if you believe that the Lord won't leave you comfortless, he won't leave you by yourself. He won't leave you struggling, trying to do life on your own. He says, I will come to you. Yes, I'm leaving, but I'm returning just in another form right now. I won't leave you comfortless. And that's important because just before we started the sermon, I talked to you a little bit about the earth groaning, Romans chapter 8, verse 22. And I need you to understand, as Sister Michael ministered to us uh, in song, I really sensed the Spirit encouraging my heart that God's plan is being executed in the earth. Despite the chaos and the mayhem and the discord and the darkness and the unprecedented evil that we see, God's still working. Don't treat God like he's an absentee landlord or, you know, he's the husband who started a renovation project but didn't finish it. No, God still, he's still working, he's still working in those who allow him to work. He's still working in those who allow him to work. And so, just like the earth groaning in expectation for the return of the Son of Man, so we, in travail, sometimes in great discomfort, we still have this expectation that the Lord's coming back. We don't like the way things look right now. We don't like the way things feel right now. We're not accepting of the current culture of things, the current state of things. This is not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be at odds with one another. We're not supposed to have this level of suffering with all of the sophisticated technology and all of the things that we know and all of the things that we can do. There's not supposed to be this kind of suffering. Many argue that there should be no hungry people in the richest country in the world. I would argue there should be no hungry people in the world. I would argue that there's enough technology present to us now. We know enough now to feed every woman and man and every boy and girl in the world for a lifetime. Have you ever seen how much you can get out of a box of grits? Now that I'm counting calories, I measure everything, and so now I eat, a, I eat a quarter cup of grits. I can get 18 servings out of every box of grits I buy. Do you know how much a box of grits costs? You're trying to tell me you can't feed everybody in the world? Just pass out some grits. No, I'm not comfortable. No, things aren't right. But I also know that God's still working. We see it. We call it heroism. We used to call it neighborliness. When we watched the folks in Houston pull out their boats and go and save their neighbors, when we watched the man who owned the mattress store open up his stores and just let people come in and sleep on all those brand new beds, and he fed them and he sent out his delivery truck to go and save some of them, and we go, he's a hero, okay? But we used to call it neighborliness. When someone calls, you know, and calls to the neighbor and says, hey, did you make it out of the house? And they go, no, we didn't make it out of the house. And they say, well, send somebody for you. And then they get on TV and the, the reporter says, don't you know that you're a hero? I love it when people say, no, I'm just, I'm their neighbor. That's the way it's supposed to be. And we understand that there's decreasingly this spirit of helping and love toward one another. And does that make me comfortable? No, it doesn't. But it also does not say to me that God is not in control. God is still in control because even in our darkest and worst times, we still see God's love being demonstrated. We still see God's love being demonstrated. And the father says to us through his son, Jesus Christ, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And even when things are just uh, devastatingly catastrophic, even in the harshest and worst times, we still see light. We still see light. And that's God saying, I told you. I told you. When you needed comfort, I'd be there. And how many of you know when you need comfort, God's there. So the first thing I want you to have is that expectation. Lord, I know you're in me. 
You can't be measured with a cup or a thermometer or by a blood test. or You can't be seen by an x-ray or an MRI. But I know you're in me. And I expect that you're going to do everything that you've ever said you're going to do. Starts with expectation. They were in that one physical place. They were with one accord. They agreed the Lord's coming. Don't know how. Don't know from what direction. Don't know exactly when. But we're just going to wait for him. How many of you are content to wait on the Lord? All my appointed days, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. Amen. So the scripture says that the spirit of God, it descends. There's a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it fills all the house. Doesn't fill the people, it fills the house. Doesn't fill the people, it fills the house. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. I want you to know today that God's spirit is in this house. It may not be in everybody in the house, but here's the comfort. The spirit's in the house. We're going to get to being filled in a minute, but, but right now I'm still on expectation. I want you to have this expectation that God's spirit's in the house. Expect that he's here. No, you don't feel him or you don't see him, but he's here. I have no doubt he's here. You know how I know he's here? Because I brought him here. Amen. The Spirit of God showed up this morning in a red Hyundai Sonata, drove up into the parking lot, wearing a white dress shirt and some gray slacks. I brought him here. He caught a ride with me from Pomona. So I'm here to say that I brought the Spirit with me. Did he come in your car? Is he wearing your clothes? So he's here. Spirit's in the house. Fill in the house. Whatever you want, whatever you need today, it's here. But you have to have expectation. If you're troubled, peace is here. If you're sad, joy is here. If you're sick, healing's here. If you're bound, deliverance is here. It fills this house. Number two, then it fills the people. Verse 4, and they were all filled, and they were all filled. One more time. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, instead of just filling the house because they had expectation, the Spirit now fills them because they were ready to receive. They were ready to accept they were expecting, they were anticipating. Now they receive and are filled with the Spirit. Why is it important to be filled with the Spirit? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God is a Spirit. God is a Spirit. And the Scripture says that them that worship Him, they must do so in Spirit. The prerequisite of being a God worshiper is having the essence of God because the Spirit of God is the essence of God. What is God? God is a Spirit. So by being filled with the Spirit, you are now filled with the essence of God. The fall of humanity, the sin of Adam, essentially vacates or voids the permanent presence of God in humanity because Sin, which was already in the world, Adam didn't bring sin into the world. His fall didn't bring sin into the world. We learn from Scripture that sin was already in the world, but it was not in Adam. Let me tell you something. You are in this world, but you are not of it. Right. Amen. You can coexist with sin, but sin should not exist in you. Sin will be all around you, but it should not be in you. Now, what are you preaching, Pastor? Are you saying, I should never, ever sin? Well, the scripture says, beloved, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you do sin, know that you have an advocate with the Father. So I can't go further than the scripture goes. There is a tacit admission by the scripture that we do fall from time to time. But here's what I'm saying. You should not live in sin. Amen. I visit Disneyland. I don't live there. You see the difference? Occasionally I go, but I don't live there. You should not live in sin. You should not, your address should not be in sin. Understand that. And what allows that? 
the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because where the Holy Spirit is, there is immediate eviction of sin. Sinfulness. Doesn't mean you stop doing all the wrong things right away. No, but you have power to begin to rebuild and restore the life that God put in you. You have power. You can do something that you can't do on your own. You can go past rehabilitation into redemption. Amen? You can go from rehabilitation to redemption. And what does that mean? You now have power to walk by faith. Because the opposite of sin is walking by faith. Because in the book of Romans, here's what we, book of Romans, here's what we learn. We learn something very important. We learn that anything not done in faith is sin. So that if, if I'm walking in faith, the just shall live by faith. If I'm walking in faith, if I'm living in faith, then as long as I'm consistently living in sin, excuse me, in faith, then I don't have to worry about sin. If I'm, look, I'm not asking you to manage your sin. I need to, I'm going to park here for a minute because this is important. One of the difficult things about the Christian life is the idea that anything I do that's wrong can send me to hell. We are not saved by works. We are saved by grace through faith. God smiles on you because he wants to smile on you. He loves you because he wants to love you. He shows you favor because he wants to show you favor. What he asks of you only is that you live a life in faith. And if you reorient your thinking away from managing sin toward what can I do today to show that I have faith in God. If every day you wake up purposing that day to live a life that shows you have faith in God, I guarantee you your life will not be sinful. Because it's impossible to host the Holy Spirit in your being and a sinful heart at the same time. Right? Because God don't live in a ghetto. You understand what I'm saying? When your life is sinful, it's tantamount to having the ghetto in you. And God don't live in the ghetto. When he moves in, he renovates everything. All things have tears down the drywall, rips up the floor, relays the foundation. All things are new. He not only restores us, but he redeems us. He restores value to us. Why is it important to have the Holy Spirit? Because nothing happens of any consequence in the Christian life until the Holy Spirit shows up. Is the Holy Spirit doing the work in you? You know, oftentimes I will say to you, you need to, you need to read your Bible and you need to pray. But before you do any of that, you need to receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Because the Holy Spirit is the active ingredients in your life. It is the Holy Spirit that helps you understand what you're studying. It is the Holy Spirit that takes the words of your prayer and deciphers them to God with, with a groaning, with a... With a a groaning that can't be uttered by us, the scripture says. We need to be filled with the spirit because that is the essence of God. It is what draws us closer to God. So we go from filling the house to filling the people. But then verses 41 through 47 completes the picture. Because while we need to have God present among us and while we need to have God present in us, the real purpose of the Holy Spirit is to help us function the way God wants us to. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in, live in residence in us to just be dormant. There needs to be a power that operates through us. There needs to be a power. In fact, the instruction given to those folks is you go and tarry. You wait until the Spirit comes upon you because after that, there will be power. God wants us to have power. Pastor, what are you talking about when he says God, God wants us to have power? He wants us to walk in authority. Authority. You should have authority in your life. What does it mean to have authority? Well, then you'll have to read the scripture to learn all of the areas that you can have authority. But certainly you can have authority in the very basic and fundamental areas of your life. For instance, your basic needs. For everyone here who struggles with basic needs, paying the rent, buying groceries, transportation, clothes, whatever your basic needs are, all of your needs are met in Christ. And you have authority, 
you have authority to activate that promise in your life. So that when you do reach that point where your money's looking funny and you don't know exactly how a need's going to get met, because you walk in that authority, all you have to do is recall and rehearse that God has promised you that he will supply all of your needs. That's authority. I want you to think of authority less as these, these grand shows of, of gifts of healing the sick and prophesying. I want you to think about how it operates on a daily basis, right? That authority is why your bills are getting paid, even though on paper you're not making enough money. That authority, that authority is why that, that, why that pain went away, even though you didn't take anything for it. When you said, Lord, help me, I, I can't take this pain, and uh, I can't go to the doctor because I can't afford it, or I can't buy the medication, so Lord, just be my help, and, and all of a sudden, there's a subsiding of the pain, and it's eased. That authority is why when someone close to you is really sick and struggling or has even died, that authority is how you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you right now. I don't know why this happened. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. But Lord, I trust you. I trust you to be my strength and to be my peace and to even be my joy in the midst of all this suffering. That authority is why God comes to you in such a powerful way and uplifts your heart and strengthens your legs and your back. And you can get through that thing. Not only can you get through it, but you can help somebody else through it. It's that authority. It's the authority over depression, over anxiety, over frustration. It's authority over disappointment. It's that authority that allows you to go to work in the morning, and even though you've made up in your mind you don't like none of those people, right? Anybody have days like that? It's like, I don't like none of y'all. Amen. A lot of people raise their hand on that one, right? But it's that authority that allows you to go there and treat them with grace and to do your job with excellence and treat everybody with dignity. In fact, it was that authority that rode you out of bed in the first place. <laughs> when you was gripping them covers for life, right? God's authority works on a very basic level because if it doesn't work on that level, it's not working right on any level. See, Paul talks about this when he says, I don't, I don't want to go ahead and, and, and preach uh, deliverance to all these people and myself be a castaway. I want to be the first fruit of what God's doing. You, you need to be the first fruit of what God's doing. I need to be the first fruit of what every sermon I preach, every lesson I teach needs to apply to me first. And all of the advice we give to others, how many of you know this? All the advice, anybody here giving advice to friends? Anybody that person that friends call on? You know, man, girl, you, let me tell you, what, what do you think I should do about this? You just, you just dispensing out wisdom to everybody. You, you the guru in the group, right? But your own life's a shambles. Shouldn't you eat first? What does the captain say when the plane takes off or the, the, the attendant when they're giving you those instructions and they, they want to warn you if something happens, those oxygen masks, masks are going to drop. But when they drop, what do you have to do? You better suck on that oxygen first because you can't help anybody if you faint. And what I want to say to you is the Holy Spirit in our lives that stops us from fainting today. If you're feeling weak in your spiritual legs, if you're feeling like you can't go on, you're feeling like all of your energy is depleted, you don't have anything left to give to anybody, your tank is empty, you don't have drive, you don't have desire, you don't have a sense of purpose, you're not sure you can go on, you're not sure that you can deal with the stuff that's coming against you, I would have you look to see if the Holy Ghost is active in your life. Because the principal thing the Holy Spirit brings to us is power which manifests itself as the authority to claim God's promises. The God who said, no weapon formed against you would prosper. The God who said, I shall supply all of your needs. The God who said, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. The God who promised that he would fulfill every promise and that he was not slack concerning those promises. That's the kind of authority we need operating in our lives. We need to go from having the Spirit fill this house to having the Spirit fill this house. Amen. We need to go from having the Spirit fall on us. I hear this all the time in church. 
Lord, the spirit fell on us in that church. No. I don't want the spirit to just to fall. I want the spirit to fill. Lord, I don't want you just to fall on me. I want you to fill me. And I don't just want you to fill me. I want you to function through me. And how does it look when the spirit functions through me? It radically changes my life, verses 42 through 47. I live a different life. I'm more giving, verses 42 through 47. I'm more giving. I see myself as being part of a community in a world that celebrates and encourages individuality. I know that I am not my own, and my life is not my own. I am here for God's purposes. I am here to make myself a living sacrifice, and I can't just please myself, and I can't just live to be happy all the time. I have a purpose, a divine purpose. I am here to live out that divine purpose. The Holy Spirit is moving in me to enable me and empower me to live that divine purpose. And I'll never be satisfied, and I'll never be fulfilled, and I'll never feel like I'm accomplishing anything until I do what God has designed me to do. For the rest of my life, I'll always be uncomfortable, I'll always be lost, I'll only always be only half myself as long as I'm operating outside of the will of God. But when the Spirit fills me, you want to talk about happy. When the Spirit fills me, when I wake up in the morning and I know that my day is mapped out in a way where I'm, gonna inset, I'm going to persistently pursue God, when I know that that's my drive and that's my motivation, when I know that I'm listening for my orders and listening for my instructions because the scripture says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, when I know my steps are being ordered and I recognize the voice of God and all day long I'm talking to him and he's talking to me, that's the life I'm called to. So no, I can never just be happy coming to church. I got to be the church. I can never be happy just being filled once with the Holy Spirit. I need to function all the time in the Spirit. And when I go to bed at night, I need to be able to look back on my day and say, you know what, I did it God's way today. I made a couple of mistakes. I didn't get everything right. But on the whole, I did it God's way today. And God have mercy on you in this house. If you listen to these sermons week by week and you read the Bible and you pray and you talk about God, but you are not filled with the spirit and functioning in the spirit. There is no substitute for it. Heaven isn't for nice people. <laughs> Heaven isn't for moral people. Heaven isn't for people who I gave it a good old try. As many as are led by the spirit of God, as many as are led by the spirit of God. One more time. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are. They are. Not the members of Bethel Church. Not the members of the Holiness Movement. Not the Baptists. Not the Episcopal. Not the Methodists. Not the Catholics. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. Yeah. And when I close my eyes tonight, if the Lord tarries his coming in my life, when I close my eyes tonight, if he decides to take me home, I have no fear in me. I have no fear in me because I know where I'm going. Amen? Amen? Let's stand. From the tabernacle to the temple to a life. Falls in the house, which he did today. Every crack, every corner, every crevice, the Spirit is here. It fills this place. The Holy Spirit fills this place. But now I'm going to call on you. Does he fill you? Every eye closed, every head bow. If you are here and you do not have faith or you have not had faith in the past that you're filled with the Spirit, if it's been a question in you and you now want to be filled with God's Spirit, come right now. Let us pray with you. Let us pray with you as you accept right now the infilling, infilling of God's Holy Spirit. It can be done right now, today, in this place. You can leave this place with the Holy Spirit filling you. Is there one?